I think we can get started. So thank you all for coming to attend this uh, webinar series on Indian democracy, which is being hosted by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at ISER Pune. Uh, it has been coordinated by Professor Chaitra Redkar, who's one of my colleagues. And it's my pleasure to uh, have with us today, uh, Professor Neera Chando, who has a long and illustrious career still ongoing, but with a long association with Lady Sri Ram College and also with Delhi University. So starting uh, her academic uh, training in the 60s from Lady Sri Ram College, she was in the Department of Political Science there, um, eventually moving to the Department of Political Science at the University of Delhi, uh, eventually being the director of the Developing Countries Research Center. Her book on state and civil society, well titled State and Civil Society, which was published in 1995, uh, is an absolute landmark publication used uh, extensively in teaching and also recognized as being one of the authoritative works. And therefore, it's our pleasure to have her talk uh, with a title of Biography of uh, Indian Civil Society. So please join me in welcoming her. And thank you, Professor Chando. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we'll collate them at the end. Thank you. Uh, you want me to start? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, you know, I wish to kind of divide this presentation in four sections. In the first section, I want to talk about the importance of civil society to democracy. The second section, I talk about the general international context in which civil society comes up as a very important part of the political discourse. In the third section, I talk about the experience of India. And in the fourth section, I want to critically sum up some of the insights that we have gained from my experience with the theory and practice of civil society. Thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Pushkar and uh, Chetra. And I look forward to uh, interacting with you and colleagues over the next hour or so. The first section, the first point I wish to make it that civil society cannot be isolated from its context and that is democracy. In fact, we can think of no concept or the set of practices associated with that concept in abstraction from other surrounding concepts. And the location of civil society is democracy and democratic theory. For that, we will have to expand our imagination beyond the standard conceptions of democracy as competition between political parties or elections and go into the more complex and the most rewarding concept of what is the relationship of the citizen to the state. <laughs> now, citizenship means very simply that we as the people of India and the people is not a demographic category, it is a political category, it refers to citizens. We are the holders of popular sovereignty. We are the people of India who exercise political sovereignty. And that sovereignty we exercise once every five years in electing our representatives to the two positions of awesome power. I mean, the kind of control that modern states have over us is, is frightening sometimes. However, the gap between two sets of elections, that is about five years, also gives us cause to ponder is the relationship of the citizen with the state that of only electing people to power and then re-electing them or dismissing them in the subsequent election? And for that, we have to embrace a more richer conception of democracy as people who are the political sovereigns and who have the right, therefore, to participate in the activities of policy making and policy implementation who have the right to monitor their representatives, who have the right to hold them accountable and who have the right to dismiss them or re-elect them. So this constant monitoring of holders of state power by ordinary citizens is <coughs> accomplished 
through a number of associations in a space we call civil society. Now, the concept of a space or civil society is purely metaphorical. A uh, civil society, since the beginning of modern political theory and the notion of democracy, is situated somewhere between the state, the market, and the household. It is the sphere of associational life. <laughs> the logic is that the individual is, is, of course, the repository of popular sovereignty. But he or she are also peculiarly helpless. They are very vulnerable in front of this awesome institution we call the state. I mean, Hobbes was not wrong when he called the state a Leviathan, a gigantic man who exercised this complete control over our lives, sometimes to the extent of manipulating or organizing our thinking, the way we express opinions, the way we, we form opinions, the way we change our opinions, and through state power. <clears throat> now, how do you moderate? How do you curtail? How do you control state power? We have to remember that in liberal constitutionalism, two things are very important. One is a right, is the, is the paramount duty to control state power through institutions. So you are not being ruled by an individual or a set of individuals, you're being ruled by institutions. And these institutions act as a check on each other. So we have in theory controlling the executive and both being controlled by the Supreme Court. And all three of them are supposed to function within the rule of law. But there is something going beyond that. Where does the ordinary citizen find a place in this processes of governance, of policy making, of policy implementation? Because each of the policies that institutions make impact our lives to a very, very great extent. From the Citizenship Amendment Act to social rights, to security legislation, each of them impact your and my being. It affects our thinking, it affects our existence, it affects the way we write, the way we think, the way we express our opinion in columns of newspapers. So in a way, because the citizen is so, individual citizen is so isolated, is so vulnerable, since the beginning of modern political theory, what has replaced the emphasis on community, whether it's a caste community or religious community, is the notion of association. We get together in all kinds of associations. They can be bird watching clubs, they can be film fan clubs, they can be football association, cricketers, uh, fan association, or they can be social audits, they can be civil liberty organizations, they can be environmental movements. And as we go further in this presentation, you will see that many of the initiatives that have made a mark upon Indian politics have come not from political parties, they have come from this indeterminate space we call civil society. Now, membership of associations is supposed to be voluntary. You can enter an association, you can exit an association. The logic behind it is that the constitution derives its authority, institutions derive their moral legitimacy from the consent of the people. Now, the people, which I have already said is a political category, which refers to citizens, both those of us who vote, but those of us who have also been born. See, we all inhabit a community of fate. Whatever happens in one part of the country is going to affect us. There's a cyclone happening in Tamil Nadu and all of us have been glued to our television screens because we owe obligations. At the moment of independence, Indians enter into a contract. We enter into a contract setting up government, but we also enter into a contract with each other. We are fellow citizens. We owe obligations to each other. So we should be concerned about what happens to our fellow citizens, and this is precisely what associational life in civil society allows us to do. It replaces community, associational life, but in a way it gives to the modern individual a home. The modern 
an individual is peculiarly ruthless. And if you remember the, the, the discipline of psychiatry and that of sociology only took shape in a condition called modernity. So you leave your native village or you leave your native habitat. You come to where the jobs are, the place is strange, people are strange. How do you relate to others? How do you forge rules? In our own homes, we know how to relate to people who are like us and people who are not like us. The modern individual is a ruthless individual. The modern individual is a homeless individual. Associations give them a sense of belonging. When we are relating to others, even if it's through the social media, we sense, feel a sense of belonging. We also see a, feel a sense of obligation. So that was the first thing that associations do. They have a dual job. They provide a metaphorical home to the otherwise uh, isolated and, you know, individual beset by alienation and by anomie. But more importantly, they also help in moderating and monitoring state power. The second pillar of democracy, which is, so the first pillar is popular sovereignty. The second pillar of democracy, which civil society upholds, is the notion of accountability, that our elected representatives are accountable to us. We have elected them, they're supposed to be accountable to us. There are large swaths of policy making. We have no idea what is going on, but in the general parameters of policy, we should be participating either to give our opinion or to give a feedback or to engage with or to criticize. So in a way, we have the right to do so, not only through the right of participation, but two more rights. One is the right to freedom of expression. The second is the right to freedom of association. And most importantly, individuals, we must remember, are powerless unless they come together in association. I mean, I have been a teacher in Delhi University for long years. And if I had a problem, who would I go to? If I go to my vice chancellor, he or she is not going to sympathize with me because they are embodiments of power. Who do I go to? I go to my local teachers association. And this teachers association is supposed to take up my cause and fight for it. And they inhabit a space we call civil society. Now, the provenance of civil society goes back to the origins of modern political theory in Europe. And I'm not going to go into that because it takes us way back into Thomas Hobbes and the 17th century. But I'll talk about the resurgence of civil society in recent history. Well, recent history being the 1980s, which is also a long time away, but still it is relatively recent compared to the 17th century. The concept of civil society acquired a new salience, a new uh, vibrancy, a new relevance in the context of authoritarian states in the socialist world. And that was called the second world. The second world was East Europe and Central Europe, and which was controlled by the Soviet Union because after the second world war, the world had been divided into liberal democratic societies with a free market under the hegemon United States. And then you had the socialist world controlled by the Soviet Union. Now, in the socialist world, people may have had social goods available to them, but they were denied freedom of expression. And more importantly, they were denied the right to criticize their government. In a way, by the 70s and progressively by the 1980s, the East European groaning under authoritarian state, and authoritarian state means no freedom of expression. Your life, your liberty is always in danger. Anybody can come and arrest you at any point. Nobody can write an article protesting against it. You can't go to court because the judiciary is under the, under the power of the executive, and individuals are completely helpless. The two roads which lead to liberation from authoritarian states in history are revolution from above and revolution from below. Revolution from above is what provides us a case with, of, for example, nine, late 19th century Germany and Japan. Here, enlightened elites created a transformation in their society and adopted modern forms of government. 
On the other hand, you had revolutions from below, and that is when people mobilized in the cause of transforming state power, which had denied them basic liberties. The first revolution was, of course, the Russian Revolution, 1917, and then the Chinese Revolution, 1949, and of course, the nationalist revolutions, which denied to colonial power the right or the moral authority to rule populations. But in st states which were authoritarian, which denied to their people any kind of liberty, these two roads were ruled out. What the East Europeans did was to turn their back upon the state. We're not interested in state power until today. Associations in civil society are not supposed to fight elections. They don't join the state. They are a break upon state power. They adopted a third way, and that third way they called civil society. In looking at civil society in this way, they looked at the French historian, De Tocqueville, who had done a book called Democracy in America. And he had asked, how is it that American democracy manages to flourish? And he had said, the only one answer, they have association. Parent-teacher association, football clubs, you know, theater association, music lovers association. When people meet, they exchange ideas. You have the formulation of public opinion. And East Europeans adopted this model and started forming all kinds of associations from football clubs to, you know, reading associations, debating societies, discussion forum, the literary forum, theater lovers association, they started associating. And you know what happens when people get together. The story is when two people meet, they create an association. And when they create an association, there is a give and take of public opinion. And at some point, you will start engaging with state power. You will think of contemporary uh, politics, which affects you and me very, very deeply. Civil society argument, and there was even a journal that came out, I still remember, in the 1990s called Praxis, which came from East Europe and was talking about civil society. And all over the world, the concept of civil society came to be acclaimed. And now one thing civil society argument held Civil society doesn't involve itself in politics. It is involved in social association, socially bringing together people. Now, there were two organizations that civil society did not allow to enter the metaphorical sphere. One was political parties, which are hungry for power. And the other were trade unions, which had become complicit with the, with, with, uh, the power holders. So civil society creating a web of public opinion through associational life created bonds of solidarity between isolated individuals and also created a web of public opinion with the result that in 1989 when crowds assembled outside the institutions of state power, so many powerful states in East Europe collapsed. Suddenly, civil society had won over authoritarianism. What was civil society? It was a liberal idea. They did no, no longer believed in revolution. In fact, civil society heralds the end of revolution. They believe in quintessential liberal ideas, constitutionalism, rule of law, an independent judiciary, and independent media. And, of course, uh, public opinion, the power of public opinion. What the socialist world really demanded was an end to socialism that had acted as an alibi for authoritarianism. We want limited government. We want constitutional democracy. This is a script that had been authored by the English philosopher John Locke in the 17th century, that if you want to control state power, you have to do it through constitution, institution, checks and balances, so that the institutional structure of the state does not result in the concentration of power in one man or in a group of people. Power has to be distributed equally. And one of the greatest checks on political power was, of course, the market, that you allow the market to intervene. 
1989, when which was called the Velvet Revolution, because there was no violence. There were just these crowd. And if you remember your very recent history, this has happened in our neighborhood. In Nepal, hundreds and thousands of people assembled against the monarchy. That we don't no longer want a monarchy, the monarchy fell. In Pakistan, lawyers assembled against the against President Musharraf's martial law, brought back democratic government. And in India from December 15, 2019, we've had spontaneous agitation of hundreds and thousands of young people agitating against the Citizenship Amendment Act, which they felt was discriminatory against our own fellow citizens. Now, this is the virtue of solidarity, that people who were not going to be affected by the CAA were agitating. And it started in Jamia Millia in India, in, in Delhi, but it, it spread to the rest of the country. And that was a classic case of citizens mobilization against discriminatory legislation. And the prime minister had to actually come onto public forum and said, uh, we are not going to discriminate. There is going to be no national register of citizens because that was what the young people, and I have to appreciate this about university students. They actually showed us the way of solidarity with our fellow citizens who might be discriminated against. Now, in a way, Civil society is, of course, monitoring the state. It's also bringing people together. Now, it is, therefore, a project of projects. It is a project which talks about sociability. And because before politics, you have to have sociability. Before you have collective action, you have to, people have to come together, even if it's on the social media. So civil society is a project of projects. It encloses many different projects. Now, these projects need not gel with each other. I mean, you have gender struggles in civil society. You also have patriarchal organizations, which are very, very insulting about women in this, on the social media. You have, um, you know, you have organizations preaching religious harmony. You also have organizations which are completely fascist. So civil society, democratic organizations in civil society have to look at the state but they also have to look at themselves. They have to see that the battle between democratic and undemocratic organizations does not go into control, out of control. So in a way, civil society, you know, the great German philosopher Hegel had said in the early 19th century, 1820, his philosophy of right, civil society is the theater of history. So our major battles are being fought, and this will become very clear as we go on in India about the Indian experience. One last point about civil society. Civil, in civil society, you do not use violence. Civil society is peaceful. Your only, your only weapons are strikes and hartals and demonstrations and marches, occupation of public lands, sit-ins fast, you do not use violence. Violent organizations are outside the sphere of civil society. The objective is to bring people into debate with each other so that a check can be kept on state power, the power of corporate, the power of big landlords. But having said that, we have to admit civil society is an urban phenomenon. Our freedom struggle was based upon peasant organizations, but civil society is an urban phenomena led by professionals. When we had the Arab Spring, for instance, when thousands of people came onto the street and said, we want an end to authoritarianism, who were these people? Mainly lawyers, mainly students, mainly doctors, mainly educated people, and forming associations and therefore engaging in collective action to fight authoritarianism. Now in India, you know, scholars have been, had been documenting uh, associational life for a long time without knowing that they were talking about a concept that came to be known as civil society. Civil society only comes into the political discourse in the 1990s, normally 
like? We talked of it as social movements or peasant struggles or workers' struggles or gender struggles or anti-caste struggles. But the concept of associational life in India really goes back to the late 19th century when the nationalist movement took root. You had two kinds of associations. The first association was normally social reform uh, organizations, organizations that preached, uh, uh, preached against caste, against gender oppression, that talked about the importance of education, that talked about it was mainly social reform. It was kind of a paternalistic attitude. It was workers organizing in Ahmedabad, their families being taught the virtues of hygiene, how to keep your houses clean, talked the virtues of sanitation, talked about the virtues of, of, of you know, uh, keeping your house and your children educated, that kind of an organization, it was social reform of Indian society. The second kind of organization that came up were normally offshoots of the two major political forces that became evident in India from the, <clears throat> early 20th century, of course, was Congress, Indian National Congress. And the Congress has a whole host of organizations, which we call basically civil society organizations, whether it is the student organizations or the women's organizations or the Seva Dal or various organizations. Um, and of course, the religious right, which had its organization that preached for Hinduism or for Islam against conversions and so on and so forth. So associational life was not unknown in India. It was a part of the nationalist struggle, but it had an, <clears throat> a kind of a paternalistic um, nature. It was tried to intervene in the, in the affairs of citizens, in the internal affairs of citizens, to see that people were fit to become citizens, getting rid of social evils. So there was a major movement for women's organization led by the Arya Samaj, led by the, there was a movement for religious reform led by the Brahmo Samaj. Um, there was a movement for nationalism led by Tilak. I'm talking about the 19th century and in the 20th century, of course, you have a whole host of organizations. In 1947, when independence happened, and we all know that the second name of independence was partition of India, Civil society or associational life kind of retreated because the Congress took over power. Now, the Indian National Congress, it has been estimated, I'm talking about the original Indian National Congress, not about the Congress as we see it today, but the Congress of Nehru, the Congress of Gandhi, the Congress of Sardar Patel, the Congress of Motilal Nehru. They had taken over power. The party had taken over power despite Gandhi's reservations on the issue. And since the Congress was so deeply involved with the freedom struggle, people gave them legitimacy. They were seen as legitimate. I mean, there was nobody more loved than Nehru in the 50s till of course that complete calamity with China. But in a way, the Congress didn't need civil society. People, didn't, people of India didn't need civil society to intervene because the Congress was itself a federal structure. You know, it has been argued by many historians that the Congress had the unique ability, I'm talking about the Congress of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, right up to 67, to put together many different points of view. Rajini Kothari wrote a book in which he said politics in India, we don't need an opposition because all, all kinds of opinion are accommodated within the Congress. The Congress knows how to mediate, how to moderate, how to compromise, how to bring together different kinds of points of view. And the leadership had a certain tolerance for differences of opinion, for all kinds of ideology whether it be Gandhian or it be even capitalist. And a number of Congress people, men and women, were involved with the, with the religious right. It is well known. A number of them were socialists. A number of them were communists. And they could happily coexist with the Birla or with capitalists or with a, Ratan, with a Tata or with all meaning major capitalists in the Congress party. 
More importantly, the Congress Party was a coalition of big men, caste leaders, community leaders, trade union leaders, capital leaders of industry, peasant leaders. And when the central leadership introduced an agitation or called off an agitation, they dealt with these big men. These big men would in turn control their constituency. So in a way, the Congress rested upon a series of hierarchies, which allowed them to put together a number of opinions, which allowed them the politics of compromise. And that is why the Congress had place for everybody. That was the nature of the party, where they could tolerate dissent, they could tolerate um, of affirmation, they could tolerate rival points of view and through discussion, through, through kind of debate, some kind of a compromise was, arise, or, uh, was arrived at. Now, all this disappeared when Mrs. Gandhi comes to power. When Indira Gandhi comes to power and she realizes she's actually quite helpless before the major big bosses of Congress, she does two things. She's takes over power and she appeals to the Indian people. We are of course a federation and people were divided according to, she, according to their party bosses. She creates a national constituency and she centralizes power. By, the, by 1967, the unthinkable has happened. Till then the Congress was controlling both the state government and the state and the central government. In 1967, Congress loses in the states. So it is now confined to the central government with the result that the Congress system has now broken. And partly this is due to the fact that centralization of power came together in the figure of the leader and that leader was increasingly Indira Gandhi. By the 19, late 1960s, the generation was different. They had no memories of the freedom struggle. The Congress party was not legitimate because it had led the freedom struggle. People wanted things. They wanted jobs, they wanted education, they wanted food, they wanted a uh, 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 dignified life. They wanted everything the constitutional preamble promised them. You remember the preamble, we the people give to India give to ourselves a constitution which embodies justice, liberty, equality, now, in a way, they found that life was getting to be very uncertain. There was a major food crisis in the 1960s. People were short of money. The Green Revolution still was to, had to happen. And it, life was becoming very, very difficult. People didn't have jobs. And they were in, there was not only centralization of leadership, wherever you have a centralized leader, and Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the first populist. We talk of populism now today in the, in the context of Erdogan in Turkey or Putin in Russia or Orban in Hungary or Boris Johnson in England or Donald Trump in the United States and our own leader in India. But Mrs. Gandhi was the first populist. She embodied power. She destroyed organizations in the Congress party, as you can see. They are paying a price for it. They are unable to come together. Against increasing hardship, the inability of the Congress to deliver health, education, a job, a dignified life, a house, clean drinking water, absence of sickness. I mean, where else in the world do you find little babies dying of diarrhea? Because India has still not instituted a public health system. Not even after the pandemic, we have not instituted a health system. In England, if the vaccine is being rolled out on the 1st of December, they're giving it to the universal health system, to the NHS, national health system. They will disseminate the vaccine. Where is a corresponding body in India? We have not paid attention to health. We have not paid attention to education. And people were groaning. This is 1968-69. And the socialist leader, Jayaprakash Narayan, in stands up and there are thousands of young people accumulating behind him, assembling behind him, wanting an end to Mrs. Gandhi, reign, and saying, we don't want a party. This party has destroyed Indian democracy. We want a partyless democracy. And a partyless democracy is something that Gandhi had spoken of. 
Till early 70s, Jay Prakash Narayan was a direct confrontation with Mrs. Gandhi. And there was a groundswell of opinion saying an end to this corruption and this crisis. And this inability of the party to deliver. And Mrs. Gandhi had come to power in 1971, Garibi Hatao. But they had not managed to remove poverty. Completely panicking under the impact of this great upheaval against her, against her rule, Mrs. Gandhi imposed emergency, internal emergency. And this emergency led to one thing, it led to the suspension of civil liberties. I mean, I still remember the Indian Express carrying a front page blank. Second page blank, it was just a blank. They, they were censored all the time. So in protest against the censor, censorship that was imposed by Mrs. Gandhi's government, the Indian Express just published blank, uh, a blank newspaper. There were no news. We only had Doodarshan. We didn't, I was a very young student. We didn't have anything. We didn't have private channels. We I didn't have all these newspapers. And there was complete censorship. Now, in 1967, Mrs. Gandhi lifts the emergency. She's majorly defeated in the election, but something very interesting happens. 1977 is a year where we see the eruption of civil society organizations. The first organization in civil society was the civil liberties movement. You know, till then, the hold of left imaginaries upon our minds was that these are bourgeois rights, right to life, liberty, property, freedom of expression, freedom of association are bourgeois rights. We need social rights, we need health, we need absence of poverty, we need education. It was then that the Indian people realized in 1977, it is enormously important to have the right to freedom, to have the right to life, to have the right to liberty. People were put in jail for nothing. And sorry, like they are being put today in jail. You dissent, you're in jail. Where is your Article 21, which is the right to life? Article 14, the right to equality. Article 19 of the Constitution, which is the right to freedom. Where were they? In front of this onslaught against civil liberty. Then people's lives and liberties were precarious. The police would come and arrest you in the middle of the night. You couldn't go to the court because the court had become the handmaiden of the government. The popular joke was, Mrs. Gandhi asks them to walk, they crawl, the honorable judges of the Supreme Court. I'm not even pointing out what the judiciary is doing today. What has happened to civil liberties of the Indian people? Was the judiciary supposed to uphold the constitution against arbitrary power? And their civil society comes up in the form of the civil liberties movement. We want basic civil liberty. We want freedom of uh, the right to life, the right to liberty, freedom of expression, the right to form associations. And since then, civil society organizations proliferated. Women's movement has been fought for in civil, in, in civil society. The environmental movement, the Narmada Bachao Andolan was in civil society. It was the most major social movement that happened in India. After the, after the freedom struggle, Narmada Bachao Andolan got thousands and thousands of people behind the struggle. What kind of dam does India need? Now you see, this is a case of people's participation in policy making processes. We had engineers, we had architects, we had all kinds of specialists debating on how much, what have big development projects done for the poor people? They have displaced them. They have removed them from their homes, from their hearts, from livelihood, from forests. What have been developed? Okay, you give water. And today we know that the Narmaja Dam is giving more water to the capitalists. The water still hasn't reached Surat. Or the poor peasants, I'm sorry, uh, Kutch, not Surat, Kutch. The desert, uh, it was supposed to reach those poor peasants. It has been cornered by the big capitalists. Now, what is the, you go on about development, development, development. What is development done for the poor Indian? And that is where civil society organizations came up. The illegitimacy of big projects. The Green Revolution had ruined the soil in Punjab. 
Punjab today has the highest number of cancer patients because of all the pesticides and the fertilizers that went into the land. All these big projects have displaced thousands of people. They still haven't found a home. And these are tribals. These people live among the forest and the trees and the water. <clears throat> The environment movement raised these issues, the legitimacy. And you see, you have a case of actual people participation in the policy making process. And of course, the fourth important movement that came up was the anti caste movement. Or the anti caste movement had actually come up in 1971 with the Dalit Panthers in Mumbai. But that was more, you know, more in the realm of literature and poetry and anger. Here you had a sustained Ambedkarite movement in civil society asking for one thing, an end to discrimination. <clears throat> and then you have a whole host of movements which proliferate in India's civil society. You count some of them. Environment is a very big issue. Climate change is a very, another very big issue. You also have the right of gays and lesbians and transgender to a life of dignity. The battle against 377 was not fought, Article 37 was not fought by the government, it was fought by civil society organizations. In a way, you see, we see the emergence of civil society taking up issues that the government or political parties were not taking up. And we had what was called a crisis of representation of the political party, their inability to represent the Indian people. Political parties are supposed to mediate between the government and the electorate. They're supposed to represent, to proxy for their constituency in parliament. They were only playing their game of the Party. Therefore, India was not alone. They started talking of a crisis of representation in England, in the United States, since the 1960s. In the 1960s, theorists were arguing political parties are looking like each other. What is the difference with the Democrats and the Republicans? And in India, the Congress party had betrayed all expectations, all the historical memories that were associated with the Congress. It was not a party of Gandhi or even Nehru. It became a party of Indira Gandhi and then a dynastic party. That gap was filled in by civil society. They were representing people's needs. You see, we had we had all kinds of experiment, alternative science education, alternative education, Kishore Bharti in Madhya Pradesh, the processes of teaching science to the school children, experimenting with different kinds of development, experimenting with environment, how to harvest water. These are issues that concern our life. Political parties were not taking them up, not even the left. I still remember Chacha Sitaram Yechuri was a young man then. We were all young. And he wrote a very angry letter in the EPW saying, why do you need civil society organizations? We are there. And everybody responded to him saying, what have you people done? What has the left done for the people of India? They have failed to deliver their promises. Now they've all become organs of power. They've all become, they're all become oligarchs. They were hand in glove with the capitalists and the peasant leaders. They were not looking at the Indian people. If they were, people would not have been. You know, I want to tell you the extent of poverty in India till today. January 2020, Oxfam has said, uh, I just want to read this out. The human rights group Oxfam released a study at Davos ahead of the 50th annual, uh, annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. The study on India reports the richest 1% of the population in India owns more than four times the wealth held by 953 million people who make up the bottom 70% of the population. The gap between the rich and the poor, Amitabh Beher, who is the CEO, said, cannot be closed without government intervention. The government is not 1% of India's population has more than four times the wealth held by 953 million people who make up the bottom 70%. You can imagine the extent of inequity. Is this what 
73 years of independence have done for us and what have we got? Then of course the finest moment came when the UPA one came into power in 2004. And this is in Sonia Gandhi organized the National Advisory Council where she associated a lot of NGOs to help her develop a social agenda. And we have all the path breaking rights that are today on the anvil emerging. Now I have to be very clear about this. <clears throat> this was the quote. In 2001, the People's Union of Civil Liberties went to the Supreme Court, citing the central government in 29 state governments for violating the rights of the Indian people and not providing them food. There was a famine in most of India, particularly Rajasthan. And the petition said that even the British had a policy not to make the people starve. And the Indian government has overflowing food stocks and people are starving. Now, the Supreme Court, which had been complicit with the emergency government of Mrs. Gandhi, wanted to retrieve its image. And the, the, the Chief Justice of India gave a scathing scolding to the Vajpayee government. This was 2001. They said, you're overflowing food stocks and people are starving. So the Vajpayee government, uh, Mr. Vajpayee from 15th August 2001, gave a lecture, uh, gave his talk at you know, that historic talk at Red Fort, in which she announced the Sampuran Rosgat Yojana, which became the seed of the right to work. Now, the right to food, the right to work, the right to information, the right to primary education were some of the major, the land resettlement bill. These were the major initiatives taken up by civil society organizations in the National Advisory Council. Now, they may have had their problem, then I'm not going to go into it because that's a different story also. I mean, people all over the world, I was in Delhi University then, and people were, you know, scholars were writing to me saying, we want to do a project on India. Will you people partner us? Has a social revolution come to India? At the same time, the court refused the Narmada Bachao Andolan that the height of the dam should not be increased because the more the dam goes up, the more people are displaced from the mountains. So there is a limit to civil society. Civil society works within the boundaries. So you have civil liberties movement looking after civil liberties and you have now a social rights movement in the years 2004 to 2009 upa2 was quite a disaster and then this government comes in in 2014. <clears throat> now there are classically there have been three routes to welfare states in the world the first route is a scandinavian route sweden norway denmark the root is that workers' organizations or trade unions link up with peasant groups and with a social democratic party to create a welfare state. So there is a coalition between workers, peasants, and political parties, labor parties, or the social democratic party. The second route has been taken by Singapore and East Asia, by Lee Kuan Yew, for instance. Now, his route is very different. His route was he didn't allow his people freedom of expression, but he gave them social goods. So you have social goods without social rights. I mean, you don't have the right to ask for these goods. They're given by a benevolent dictator because he doesn't want an uprising, but he does not allow you freedom of expression. So there is no mobilization. In Scandinavia, there was political mobilization, but here there is no mobilization. There's no talk of rights. There is social policy. This is not social rights. Now, increasingly under the government of Mr. Narendra Modi, and the BGP has historically not been a welfareist party, but was driven into welfareism once it came into power, they started legislating social policy. At the same time, the civil society has been repressed. So you have freezing of funds, no funds being allowed to civil society organizations, civil society leaders being arrested. 
Now, in a way, so you have pulverization of political and civil liberties, but you have social policy. So there is social policy without the notion of rights. Now, rights are important because rights realize my status as a citizen. If you're a citizen of India, you have rights by virtue of the fact that you are born in a community of We cannot be happy if our fellow uh, citizens are unhappy or if they are poor or if they are... I mean, how could we be... It, one thing, we had the pandemic on our head. On the other hand, we had these millions of migrants walking to their homes. Wouldn't it shake your conscience? What have we done for the workers in India? Organized working class is only 6% of the total working class. 94% are migrants. Here, civil society stepped in because they were fed and they were clothed by civil society initiatives. But why are they in such a position? Can we be a flourishing country if 94% of our 40 million people walked home and many of them died on the way? You know it. We saw it on your TV screen. It was the biggest shame to visit us. This is a reflection on us as a society. We have failed to get rights, to secure our rights, to realize our rights. And the Indian government has not given the people rights. On the other hand, our political liberties and political liberties are in danger because all of us will have to prove citizenship. And our civil liberties are in danger because the least thing of this, uh, a symptom of dissent when you're in jail. How many of us are in jail? How many of our friends are in jail? Our comrades, our colleagues. So in a way, you know, this whole rights talk that first you have political and civil rights, then you have social and economic rights has been turned on its head. Because rights are integrated. You cannot have meaningful political and civil rights unless people have basic food, a house, health, education, jobs. But you cannot have health, education, job without political and civil rights. So rights are an integrated. They're not stage theories. These are integrated theories of rights. Finally, this leads us to conclude. What is civil society about? You cannot have a democratic state without civil society, without people's participation, without associational life, without people engaging with the state, without people engaging with power. But you also cannot have a democratic civil society unless you have a democratic state. So if your state is curtailing your freedoms, you cannot have a civil society. Your civil society is pulverized. The vibrancy of civil society depends upon a democratic state. So civil society is a fragile concept. It's not a robust concept. It is a concept that is dependent upon three or four very important things. One is an independent media. But you can't have an independent media when your media houses are controlled by corporate houses. Every which TV channel has not been bought over by a corporate house. That means the anchors are telling us what their owners are telling them to do. Which newspaper is not owned by a corporate house? And here you have to, you know, across the world, there's a very interesting intervention going on, and that is called funding of newspapers by the readers. Guardian in England, Le Monde in France, and now The Wire in India, the online journal. We are all subscribing, to, we're giving up uh, monthly something, whatever we can to The Wire, so they don't have to depend upon corporate houses. You cannot have a free media if you have corporate controlled media. <clears throat> you need a free judiciary. You need an independent judiciary to uphold the constitution against go See, governments come and go. Governments are naturally intolerant. Governments are naturally authoritarian. What keeps a government in check are institutional control and a vibrant civil society. When both of them are repressed, how do you have limits upon government control? So we no longer have revolution on our agenda. We have civil society, but even civil society can push back the boundaries of the political system. 
it is important for democracy, but let us not glamorize civil society. It is not exempt from casteism, gender bias, or homophobia. What we have to do is therefore fight on a constant basis against undemocratic civil society organizations. Thank you. I'll end here and we can hopefully have a discussion. Thank you, Pushke. Thank you. Thank you for that talk. It was like a flawless diamond, clear and scintillating. So uh, thank you. We all enjoyed it. Uh, we already have had questions coming in, three of them so far. And Chaitra will moderate the questions and uh, read them out to you. They're in the chat box on the right, in case you want to look at them yourself. But I'll hand it over to Chaitra, who will read them out and moderate the discussion. Yeah, Hello. I only got one. Yeah, to tell me, Chaitra, I'll, I'll depend on you. Yes, I'll, I'll read them out. So the first one is by Manish. Um, the associations that you are talking about, uh, I'll read out the second one. It's by Professor Aruna Pense. Uh, the resurgence of religiosity or uh, pseudo-religiosity has overwhelmed all the uh, modern aspects of civil society. How do we understand it and counter it? Yeah, um, you know, we have to distinguish between religion as faith and religion as politics. This religion as politics that we are seeing today has nothing to do with faith. Now there is a uh, there is a, um, uh, there there is a I think an FAR being filed in the court against this uh, web series a suitable boy. Frankly, I think it's a very uh, badly done web series. If left to itself, it would have probably just faded from memory. It has not, nothing to do with religion. It has to do with politics, and certainly it has overwhelmed. A you know, secular modes of thinking, we have to think, but as long as we do see it as a distortion of religion, as, relig as religion, as power, we should be able to understand that religion is being harnessed to a project of political power. TK? Yes. yes. Yeah. And there is this third question by Veer Pratap Gautam. Um, XCJI commenting that judiciary and executive should work in sync together with the constitution fundamentally working on principle of checks and balances with judiciary and executive being mutually exclusive and top judge sent to um, uh, uh, Rajya Sabha immediately after um, writing uh, judgments in favor of government. Before that and even after that judiciary hasn't been any different what are we supposed to go uh, when uh, supposed to do when the custodian of constitution is working in the interest of government issues like CAA, NRC, 370 and other major issues still pending to get a hearing for the first state also. You know, I think this is a very uh, well put uh, comment and it's self-explanatory. It's actually the custodians of the constitution have become a part of power politics. And this is very sad because sometimes when Anand Tetumle or Gautam Navlakha and, uh, you know, there was this attack on Siddharth Vadarajan or the entire Algar Parishad, which took place, um, uh, I mean, it seems to me that where do we go? I mean, honestly, ordinary citizens today, our political party system is in a system, a state of complete collapse. Civil society is pulverized. The judiciary has, seems to have thrown up its hands in despair. Where do we go? We are in a situation of complete helplessness. Now, personally, all of us are very pleasantly surprised after the CAA was passed, there was this moment of discomfort that what's going to happen now, who's going to speak back to the makers of this law and suddenly young people were coming up. I mean, I was so happy to see Delhi University 10,000 students marching in the freezing rain of January against the bill. But even that is now being linked, those leaders are being linked to the uh, communal riots taking place in Delhi, which took place in Delhi in the last half of February. It's really very worrying because it seems to me you no longer even have a viable opposition. We don't have civil society. We don't have a judiciary which actually uh, privileges civil liberties over any other aspect. 
what are we going to do? I think we are very vulnerable. And I think your question is phrased very well. I read it. It's phrased very, very well. And we share your concern. We look to you guys to show us the way out once again. Um, there is uh, another question by Lo Kamarul. Yes. Uh, writing, um, what about mobility of civil society at local level? To me, it seems many problems you address like poverty with uh, uh, which union governments keep failing need local response, but civil societies have failed miserably at local level in India. For example, board committees established to demand ac accountability from corporators in Bangalore um, have become uh, namesake. No, no. As I said, let's not glamorize civil society because civil society is part of the same social phenomena that marks the rest of society or the state or the market or even the, uh, the family, the household. Uh, you know, the only thing is that what is bothering many observers of civil society is the NGOization of civil society. Now, in classical literature, civil society is not meant to be peopled by organizations. It's meant to be spontaneous movement, neighborhood associations, all kinds of clubs, all kinds of societies, all kinds of associations. But after in, the, in Eastern Europe, uh, these velvet revolutions had overthrown these authoritarian states, civil society was seen as the key to democracy. And a number of funding agencies, the, the United Nations, the World Bank, they all started funding international organizations. And in a very major way, a number of NGOs that are in India today are offshoots of international NGOs and they are funded by them. Oxfam is one organization that has insisted on local funding. Many of us have written about the NGOization of civil society, that where is the social, where are the social movements? Where is the popular mobilization? Where is, where are all the groups? But in the aftermath of this crackdown on civil society, we've all kept quiet because let us have NGOs at least that speak up. And many of them are speaking, Oxfam was speaking up. Amnesty was speaking up under Akar Patel in Bangalore till they were raided and the ED was put on them. Uh, but I'm afraid this NGOization, I mean, uh, has become a bit of a problem because now we have very well-funded NGOs which have become career options for upwardly mobile, uh, mobile professionals. <clears throat> um, how far is civil society going to be democratic when it is uh, offshoot of an international organization? I mean whose agenda does it follow? These are questions that even sympathizers and fellow travelers of civil society have to ask. Finally, I'll just say one thing, you know, any kind of politics, it's not that civil society doesn't do politics. Of course it does politics. I mean, all of us do politics. Politics are not exempt from society. So it, it doesn't compete for political power. It doesn't stand for election. So some of them do, but they're no longer civil society then. The point is politics cannot be its own defendant, judge, and jury. <clears throat> politics has to be evaluated. So even if it is the politics of an organization that you otherwise have sympathy with amnesty or civil liberties movements, Interested observers have to ask questions. Now, many occasions I have been attacked by civil society organizations, you armchair intellectuals. Now, the task of an intellectual is not to theorize the here and now. The task of an intellectual is to bring a historical perspective to bear upon current issues. You know, if you've been reading about the Love Jihad legislation, which is being passed by various governments in North India, they bear an uncanny resemblance to the legislation passed by the Nazi regime in Germany that RN Germans will not marry Jewish people because they didn't want to sully the blood, blood stream, the blood stream. Now, in a way, you can have to understand history in order to understand the present, and that is a charge. 
and I think civil society, that is a task of an academic. Now, civil society organizations have to understand that they are not above, con uh, you know, uh, comment or criticism. And that is something, if you're working for the people, then somebody has the right to ask you, who are your representatives? Because there are many organizations out there which are frankly very conservative. So this is a battle. This is a battle that all of us have to fight. And now increasingly the younger people have to fight. We have done our job. Now we have to fight, right? Uh, there are a couple of uh, the questions coming up. So this one is by Anandi uh, Rahadgaukar. Uh, she writes, our country reflects diversity, but this diversity tends to get in clutches of politics in the present scenario. How would civil society see to it? Yeah, I think we should be wary of any civil society organizations that talks about a homogenized culture or homogenized India. Uh, because the effect to flatten our diversity is inevitably at the cost of uh, the uh, less dominant cultures. I mean, the effect, the effort to Hinduize, for example, the Adivasis, is I think a sheer injustice to the diversity and the alternative points of view that Adivasi present to us. For example, the ability to live with nature. We diminish our own capacity to understand from other points of view. We become lesser human beings because we have no other point of view from where we draw our own perspectives, our own thinking. See, we are dialogical animals. We dialogue with others, but we also dialogue within ourselves. Now, unless you have a rival perspective, a rival point of view to challenge your own opinion, you just become opinionated. You don't become a knowledgeable human being. Human beings should be able to question themselves and ability to tolerate questions. The moment you stop tolerating alternative points of view, you're homogenizing the country. You're homogenizing society. India is a diverse society. And I think we should respect that point of view because we will become a very boring society if everybody thinks exactly like us. or we think exactly like the other way person does. There'll be no debate, no dialogue. And it bothers me sometimes where the big debates have gone. I mean, are we debating about literature, about a film? What are the films that we have? What is the height of cultural creativity that we have on our hands today? What was the last film that made some way? I mean, what do we have? Toilet of Prem Katha, that film? What kind of a film was that? Where are they really challenging the films of M.S. Satyu, the village films of Tendulkar, the films of all the great Marathi playwrights? I don't see them. I don't see a, a debate happening. We don't encourage rival point of view. You know, we even suppress the gender voice. So I don't know this, this, this flattening out of diversity is going to cost us very heavily as a civilization. Because as a sophisticated civilization, we should have the capacity to respect other points of view. But this reminds me of a piece I'd read by Ranaji. I've just read it, Ranaji Guha and Subaltern Study 7. And he talks about two movements in colonial India. One was the um, movement against the partition of Bengal, the Swadeshi movement. And the other was the non-cooperation movement of Gandhi in 1931. Uh, no, 1921, right? Yes. 31 was a civil disobedience, right? And in both movements, he chronicles how people who didn't agree with either the Swadeshi aspect, you remember Satyajit Ray's filming um, Tagore's Ghare Bhaire? And how, they, you know, Tagore was very worried about the violence that had been unleashed in the, in the movement for Swadeshi. And anybody, writes Ranajit Guha, anybody who differed with the movement was subjected to a social boycott. For example, if you were a, 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 a hairdresser and you disagreed with the Swadeshi movement, nobody would come to you to get a haircut. A pandit wouldn't go to you to, uh, to your house to perform rituals. Now, this actually frightened me because if dissent was not going to be tolerated, in the high point of in India's assertion against the partition of Bengal, now what chances do we have that's going to be tolerated in a post-independence India? 
Gandhi was very worried about the way his supporters would suppress rival points of view in the non-cooperation movement. Anybody who didn't agree with you was subjected to nobody would go to their house, nobody would buy from them, nobody would perform rituals. I mean, what, what kind of a movement is this? You know, the crux of your right to freedom is very simple. The right to do or the right not to do. You have the right to vote, nobody can stop you. But you don't want to vote, nobody can force you. Now, that aspect of, of your right to be yourself is the crux of diversity. We all have different opinions, let a thousand flowers bloom. But the cutting down of this diversity is diminishing us as a civilization. It is something that we should be conscious of while we look at our history. Yes. Um, there is this question from Maruguri Fernandez. Um, uh, ultimately, it is democratic and moral value which are important for achieving uh, the desired goals of uh, socio-economic development for all. Unless the leaders at the top have such values, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to achieve the desired goals, even if civil society has, this, uh, has these values. Would you agree? Well, one would presume that the leadership of the future is going to come up from people who are involved in civil society movements. I mean, unless you are involved with the people at the grassroots level, how are you going to throw up a national leadership? The advantage of organizations like, for example, the Sevadal in the Congress, which has now become Moribund, or the RSS in the BJP, is that they keep the party in regular touch with the people. The RSS has done much better on this than the Sevadal, which is completely stagnant. But in a way, that is also an activist movement. Now, it depends upon what values you are talking about when you're dealing with your people, with the neighborhood, with the community. And it seeks to me that you are going to throw up a leadership which is more in touch with them. I mean, the leadership has to know what the people want and desire. And the genius of the BGP is in 2014, they understood what the people knew. They wanted a strong, decisive prime minister. And this bore results. Now, if you, unless you are a part of your civil society, because RSS is an NGO, it, it registers itself and it says it's non-political, it's a civil society organization. They keep in touch with what is happening. I mean, you look at the way um, that they monitor uh, neighborhood activities and they are there if you have a problem, they are there to help you, even if you are their opponent. I mean, you have to admire their commitment. You may not agree with their goals, or their objectives, but you have to admire any social uh, disaster, they are there, those RSS boys are there. Now the leadership has been thrown up by that and they have, because they are in touch with the people, parties like the Congress have become completely detached from the people. Now, how do you expect a leadership to respond to what the people are doing when the party leadership doesn't know? So I'm hopeful that out of civil society organizations, which are secular, which are democratic, which are Sympathetic to, sympathetic to difference and to diversity, we'll get a new breed of political leaders. They will not be civil society leaders, but that would have prepared them for a political role. So we look towards all of you to give us a new leadership in the future. Uh, there is a question uh, from Tanuja Sajde, which is actually connected with this. And uh, she writes that, please comment on the anti-corruption movement of Anna Zare and emergence of Amadmi party uh, from uh, civil society action to become a political party. So how would you uh, see this development? See, I think the emergence of the ARP has been welcome because it provided everybody in Delhi um, with a third alternative, apart from the Congress and the BJP, and that has to be welcomed. The problem with ARP is a problem with the Anna Hazare movement. They were a they are a post-ideological movement. I mean, corruption is not ideology. Well, corruption is not even a political concept. Politics is always contested. How can you contest corruption? Corruption or governance for that matter? These are administrative issues. See, the least corrupt country is Singapore. But Singapore is not a democracy. It's a police state. So I always thought Anna Hazare was a very confused man. 
ideologically. See, he's done great things for that village he's in, except that he's also, he also punishes people who disagree with him. We, I know we studied Kana Hazari early before he came to prominence. Now this battle against corruption struck a chord because people, it, it affects people's daily life. But if you look at the gatherings in India Gate where he was uh, meeting, uh, you know, when he was holding forth, they included everyone from the left to the right, from the communalist to the secular, from the capitalist to the peasant, the worker. So ideologically, it was not very clear. It was not an ideological movement. It was a movement against a problem that is that can be tackled administratively. AAP, unfortunately, insists on being a party of governance. Now, governance, I've always felt, is not a political concept. Governance was a very deliberate option for the World Bank to choose as a mode of political discourse to depoliticize the entire process. How can you disagree with governance as a quality of administration? How can it be a political concept? With the result that we have the up taking very problematic positions when it comes to religion. Now, recently, I was not here for Diwali, but I was told that Mr. Kejriwal held a major Lakshmi Puja. Diwali is a festival of goodwill. Don't make it a Hindu festival. Make it a, we should celebrate every festival as a social occasion to make links between people. And I feel, in a way, the AAP doesn't know what it's doing. It's becoming a big BJP in many respects. It has done very good things in education and health. But ideologically, it doesn't have any ideology. And if you don't have an ideology, you can go hither and thither. You can go anyway. That is my frank appraisal of the AAP. Though I admire it in many ways, I'm also a little worried about the direction in which it is going. I think Shubham's question is uh, answered in this and Surekha's question also was uh, responded to in the uh, earlier questions. So um, I think uh, that uh, we have taken all the questions that all the participants have asked and uh, it's really, uh, a very interesting interaction that we had. Um, I'm sure that uh, we are there. There is so much that we are uh, uh, taking from this. Uh, of course, the students uh, who are doing this course, it's uh, certainly very useful for them. But otherwise, also there is lots of food for thought, which uh, we uh, got from your talk. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Chando, for uh, sparing time for us and giving us very interesting insights on um, civil society in India. This is an ongoing series on Indian democracy. This was the third talk in the series, and we are um, going to continue this series, uh, not only this semester, but uh, it would be uh, sort of an ongoing activity of humanities and social science departments of ISER Pune. And I'm looking forward for more interaction with you as well in future. We will certainly trouble you with uh, our, uh, queries and, uh, and questions, and I'm sure you will uh, uh, spare time for us. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Chetra and Pushkar. And thank you, everybody. These were really very interesting questions. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you to all the participants and uh, we are closing for today. Thank you.